thanks everybody for coming out and, and during the lunch hour too. This is fantastic. I was I was worried that it'd be like just like two of my closest friends would be able to come out. So so thanks you guys for being here. Uh, I'm Guillermo Moratorio, and today we're gonna look at DevTools debugging, the greatest hits. So uh, quick poll of the audience, and, and and I'm so glad that Kyle mentioned this this morning. Actually, you know what? I have a tendency to run long, so I'm gonna start a timer before I forget. So I want you guys to be able to get your real lunch after this. Okay. So uh, I'm so glad Kyle said this earlier today uh, because all of us are here. We're here to learn stuff. Really, this is you know a, a no judgment zone, right? So I'm going to ask a, a poll of the audience here before we get started. And please be honest. With regard to Dev Tools, raise your hand if you feel like you are a Dev Tools expert, like you're a master. And in worst case, if I pass out, you can just come up here and do better than me. Oh, okay, great. So you guys won't know the difference. You, uh, how do you feel like you're like middle of the road? Uh, kind of like, you know what, I, I've used it a bit, I'm getting pretty good at it, but I, you know, okay, fantastic. And then how about those who are like, you know what, like, this describes me, right? I'm, just, <laughs> I'm a console logger in a dev tools world that I want to like, see if get better. How many people kind of feel like this then? Sweet, awesome, sir, about half and half. Fantastic, it's really great to hear. So, what I would like us to try and do as a group today is let's try and level up as a team together, right? So, what I'm going to try and do is, since we have some people that this is brand new uh, stuff, whenever we move on to a new topic or a new subject, I'm going to give a little bit of context on what exactly is going on there, what we're doing. But since we do have some people that have already a good amount of experience with dev tools, we are going to ramp up pretty quickly in terms of the features and things that we move through. Uh, one other thing that I will say, I'm going to go through a lot of different uh, hotkeys and shortcuts that I like to use. Uh, and we're going to go through a lot of different uh, things of the functionality of DevTools. Don't feel like you need to try and write everything down and memorize everything right away, because there's going to be a lot of it. So I would recommend just try and follow along and, and see sort of like where we're going and the approach that we're taking. And then these slides will be posted, these talks will be posted, uh, the videos will be posted. You'll have access to all these different things. And then uh, as I had here, you can always reach out to me in Denver Devs. Uh, if you're, who's been a Denver script before and seen me talk Denver script? Okay, so you guys know I love DevTools and I always dive into it. So I'm more than happy to chat more with you about it after. So what we're going to look at, okay? DevTools is a massive project uh, that they have an entire team that Google dedicated to. Uh, it, I mean, it's nearly endless in the amount of things that it can do. So in order to time box ourselves here as best as I can, uh, we're going to try and only look at three specific tabs in DevTools. The Elements tab, the Console tab, and the Sources tab. For those of you that raised your hands and said, hey, I don't really know DevTools at all, no worries. Uh, we're going to go into them in a pretty good amount. So even if these names mean nothing to you yet, hopefully you'll be a little more familiar with them by the time we're done. Okay? So, with that, let's look at some live code. So I've written uh, this, this uh, cool little app. It's very, very straightforward. Uh, hopefully there's not too many UX people in here. It's not beautiful, but it's simple. And what it does is it hits a backend API, and it's going to pull all the different talks that you might want to see at the Develop Vendor Conference today and tomorrow. We're going to have a list of those talks. You can click on them and see some details on them. Um, and yeah, sort of a standard list drill down kind of app. So let's pull it up. Okay. Well, that's embarrassing. <laughs> Luckily, we're at a debugging talk, right? So let's see if we can figure out what the heck is going on, right? So uh, just by looking at this, I would guess, right, we are probably having a problem fetching from our back end and getting our results back, right? So the first thing we're going to do is let's go ahead and open, open up DevTools. Uh, caveat, all of my shortcuts that I'm telling you are going to be Mac specific. You can look up their uh, PC equivalents, and I'm so sorry for you if you're PC. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is open up DevTools. We're dealing with Command Option J. So uh, I'm going to clear the console with Command K. You'll see me doing that a lot. It's clearing so we have a clean space to look at. Um, so we were saying that we're probably not getting back from the back end what we want. So let's try and see if we can figure out what's going on. If we go over to the Sources tab, in here, on the left, we can see a directory of all of our different files that are being served up. We have access to all of them, our reducers and actions. This will look familiar for those of you that know React. If not, don't worry about it. That's not the important part. But the thing I want to show you that's pretty cool is instead of having to navigate through that tree, uh, the first shortcut I'll show you that's really nice is Command P brings up a little search bar where if you type in the name of any file that is currently accessible in your directory that is being served up to your page, you can go to it directly. Okay. So I know that our main landing page that we're going to go to is called DevTools Index, and I see already an auto-completion of any files that match that text. The Chrome team's put a lot of work into doing these kinds of like helpful like autocomplete features. So let's get and open that page up. Okay. By the way, can you guys see this in the back? We're going to zoom in. You're good. A little, little more. How about that? Is that good enough? Okay. So 
So here we go, we're in DevTools Index, and right away we see on the component wheel mount that we are calling off of Frost's load talks. Once again, if you know React, this is all very familiar. If you don't, please don't get thrown off by that. I know when like too many new things are coming in, your brain shuts down. Ignore that, just look at how we're debugging these things, okay? In component wheel mount, we're trying to load our talks, all right? So we're gonna set a breakpoint here. So again, basics. Breakpoints, what it's gonna do is, it's gonna stop execution of code at this line and sort of freeze it in time, okay? Luckily, since uh, JavaScript is single-threaded, we know that no other things are going on in the background. Maybe with asynchronous workflows and stuff like that, but regardless, we're not kicking off any new actions, okay? Once we get to this breakpoint, so let's go ahead and refresh the page, and there it is, it stops right there, okay? This lets us know the highlighted line that we've stopped at that code of execution. We now have a few different things we can do. We can either, I, I call this just hitting play, we can resume script execution and it'll just keep playing until it hits the next breakpoint, Right now we have no others, so we just keep going and run normally. We can step over this line and move to the next synchronous line in code to say, okay, just what's the next thing that's happening? Or we can step into and drill into this function and see, okay, what's actually going on behind the scenes inside of this specific function. All three of these have shortcuts. I'll be using them pretty much the entire time that we're here, and I'll try to remember to read them out loud. Command backslash, backslash to play through. Command single quote to step over. And command semicolon to step in. This seems like these are kind of like cumbersome, but once you get used to them, it really improves your efficacy on how quickly you can move through the console when you're debugging or your sources tab. So I highly recommend that if you guys are getting better at DevTools, really try and spend some time on these. So what we're gonna do is, we're gonna step into this function and see what is going on behind the scenes in load talks that I'm breaking down, okay? So I'm gonna hit command semicolon and step in. Again, if you're familiar with React, this is just where we're binding the action that we're calling and how we're calling it directly in our component. So I'm gonna step in one more time. And here we see load talks. This is the function that we were calling in component will mount. And let's look at what we're doing here. We're gonna fetch some talks and we're gonna get a response back. Uh, then from there, we're pulling off the data prop. And it looks like we're expecting those talks that we're pulling off the data prop to be an array. And then we're gonna do some work on them to prepare them for their split, okay? So let's set another breakpoint actually right here. And in this case, I'm gonna do what I was saying, sort of that play button, and let it just fire through until it hits the next breakpoint, which should be this one. So I'm gonna hit command backslash to play through, and now we've stopped right here. First thing I wanna show you guys is that uh, we have this really nice hover ability in, in lots of places in DevTools, specifically here uh, is a, a really good one. If I hover over talks response, I can get a quick little preview of what is it that came back from the server. We see there's an object here, has a data property, Right, and so that's probably why we're trying to access it here. So let's step over one line, just move forward one line in our synchronous execution. Okay, let talks be populated. And now we see that talks is equivalent to talk response.data. So notice what I'm doing here, this is pretty cool, right? We can hover over a variable itself and see a little preview of what that is. And then if you have any kind of nested like dot notation or bracket notation, if you hover over that, you actually be able to walk your way in there with your quick preview, okay? Now, this is nice that we get this preview, but it's not a ton of real estate, right? So let's move back over to the console and let's look at specifically our talks response that comes back and then the talks that we're pulling off of it to see if we can figure out what it is that's going wrong here. For those of you following along closely, you probably already saw it, but let's just talk through it humanly. So uh, I start typing in the word talks. And so here's another cool thing. Lots of autocomplete features in the past year or two have been added in. It automatically knows that for any variable in scope, if I start typing it, that's probably what I want to be looking at. So if I start writing talks, I get access to talks and talks response both right here. So if I type talks response and hit enter, uh, I've selected it, I haven't entered it yet to the command line. Another thing I want to show you is this eager evaluation here. This little faded out line tells me if I were to execute this expression right now, here's the value that's going to result from it. Okay, so if I hit enter on talks response, there it is, we get this object that looks just like what we expected with the data properties that we're setting for the talks. So if I do, actually, let's, let's do that. If I do talks response dot data, right? Right, that is what we set talks equal to, so let's double check that. And yeah, they're the exact same thing. But notice that we expected talks to be an array, and it looks like it's actually an object which it has another data property and that has an array inside of it, right? So this is probably the source of our first bug, right? Our first defect is probably coming from the fact that we are, in our table actions, grabbing talks response dot data. Let's see what happens if we do dot data again and drill one level in. We should be pretty confident at this point that we're gonna be getting back what we want, right? So let's go ahead and you can toggle back and forth between these with command left and right bracket. Again, all these uh, will be provided for you. 
I'm going to deactivate breakpoints and I'm going to play through and let's refresh the page. Okay, so now we are still broken, but it's a different break, right? So now let's figure out, well, what, right? Who, who is, who is like days, every day is like this, right? Like, yeah, all the time. Like, okay, I'm not sure if we're regressing or, or you know, we're moving forward, but let's just see what happens. So, okay. So let's go back to the same breakpoint we had and let's see if we're making progress or not. <clears throat> I'm gonna re-enable breakpoints. I'm gonna refresh the page. Remember now, oh, okay. Here, we probably don't need this anymore, right? Because we already know that we're going into load talks. So we don't wanna have to like be cluttered up by all these stops. So let's take this one off and play through, command backslash. And it takes us back to this area of code that we were looking at before, right? We're gonna get our talks back. Talks now looks like an array, so that's looking good. Um, so I am stepping uh, over here one line at a time with command single quote. Let's check to see if this passes, it does. So now we're at a point where we are going to iterate over all of our talks and then just do some work to prepare them, right? But it looks like something is breaking because here we've got a good array of talks what we're displaying is not showing. So now let's try and drill it into this iterator here and see are we breaking something in the way that we try and prepare it for the UI, all right? So let's set a breakpoint inside of here. And what's gonna happen now is keep in mind, we are iterating over all the values. So for the 65 talks or so that we have on here, if we wanted to, we can go through it 65 times. It's gonna go through it every single time. So let's go ahead and play through and stop in there. And now we see, uh, once again, just sit, I'm gonna sort of repeat some of these topics. We can hover over talk and see a quick preview of that, see the index that we are in the array. And now this hovering stuff with previews also works for functions. Now, for those of you that may have tried this before and you hover over this function, all it does is just tell you this is a function. That's not super helpful, right? But there is a cool way that you can work with this where instead of just hovering over, if you highlight the whole function, including its invocation and its arguments, and you hover over that, the eager evaluation will tell you what the result of that will be if you execute that line. So the same way how we had this eager execution going on in the console, it also works inside of the dev tools themselves for any function. So this is something that I use all the time that I highly recommend that you guys try out because now, remember how we were talking about if we could step over or step into it, which we want to do, this is now where we say, well, you know what? It's probably breaking right inside this function, so let's definitely step into it, right? Because if we continue on, we're probably going to have something broken. So we found the point of our next break. So I'm going to step into this with command semicolon. Okay. Prepare talk for display. We're getting our talk. We're doing some work. Uh, let's just see what that work looks like when it's done. Okay, it looks like it is prepared, right? So we see here we've got sort of the serialized version from the server with uh, underscores. And we've got the camel case version here, so that looks good. But we're not actually returning any from this function, right? So that's probably why we were getting undefined. So once again, that's probably the source of our next bug. If we come into our code and all, and all we do is just return prepared talk. Let's see how. So let's uh, turn off breakpoints, refresh the page. Okay, so we're getting talks back. Can you guys read that in the back? <laughs> that was a joke. No, you can't. Uh, so, but that's okay. We'll get to that. So we see here that we're getting talks back, right? Um, if we hover over, they're easier to read. Uh, and now we can also sort them, so that's cool. Well, that's not great, right? It looks like we've got some blank ones here. I wonder if, if we scroll down, look, there's a blank one here, a little one there. Okay, so now we're at the point where we're getting our talks back, we're preparing them correctly, but some of them may be bad data mixed in there, right? So let's try and figure out if we can clean those out and do a little more defensive programming to figure out how do we make sure that we're presenting a nice, clean visual and accounting for things that might be coming back that aren't great. Uh, table actions. So let's do this. Let's turn these breakpoints back on. We don't need to stop up here. Let's keep stopping inside of this iterator, right? And try and move through and see if we can identify the bad data that's coming in, talk by talk, and see if we find a pattern there, okay? So now, let's refresh. We stop inside of our iterator. I hover over this talk, that looks good, let's play. Hover over that talk, that looks good, let's play. That looks good. The talk, uh, sorry, the hovering is nice, but it becomes cumbersome when you're doing this multiple times. You have to hover over, pull away, hover over, pull away. So the next section I wanna show you is this watch section where you can write the name of any variable that's in scope and it'll just keep track of it for you in real time, okay? We can also put the index if we wanted to. Anything that's in scope we'll be able to watch here in real time without having to constantly cover. So we keep playing through. These all look good, right? Okay, we're going, we're going. All right, nothing yet. Nothing yet, looking for it. Oh, did you see that one? That look, it looked like there was one that, was a, that didn't look good. 
we, it, it, let's try it a little slower so we can find the next one. It's stunning, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so now, it looks like we've got maybe some blank objects coming in with nothing inside of them, right? We know we only have about 65 talks, so if we wanted, we could do that, and I could make you guys just sit here and watch me do this several times. Or, we could think, well, we know exactly the break we're looking for. Right? Is there a way that we could have it stop only when something is broken? And luckily, we can do that with an enhanced breakpoint called a conditional breakpoint. If I right click on here and hit edit breakpoint, this is now a conditional breakpoint which will only stop if this condition evaluates the truth. Right? So, what I can do is let's say uh, only stop here if there's no talk at all. Ooh, that's a loud talk. There's no talk at all. Or if that talk, let's say, has no title. Okay? If either of these are true, the breakpoint will stop there. If not, it'll let it just fly right by. So let's refresh again. And look at that. We have our first blank one that we saw, the other blank one that we came across. This one looks like it's undefined. And this one looks like it's null, right? So here, again, we could have really gone through this manually. We only have 65 talks, but imagine if you had thousands of entries coming back from your server. And imagine instead of like several things broken, there was exactly one thing that was broken. And you have to find it, and it turns out it's index 3,423, right? You're not going to be clicking through. So this is super helpful. So now it looks like we know we're getting back from our server some data that is either completely broken or only half there. So we can be a little more defensive in our programming. And when we get this back, there's a Lodash chain. Once again, if you're not familiar with Lodash, don't worry about it. There's a helpful function in Lodash we're going to use called reject. If you guys know filter, it's the exact opposite, right? So filter says if it meets this criteria, include it in the resulting array. Reject says if it meets this criteria, exclude it from the resulting array. So we're going to write into this reject function the exact same logic we put into our breakpoint, right? We said, in the breakpoint we said, show me all the bad ones. Here we're going to say, exclude all the bad ones, right? So we're going to say, for a given talk, if there's no talk at all, or that talk has no title, Let's not include it in the array that makes it to the map function. Okay? Save that. Actually, I'm going to leave breakpoints on because what we're going to do is we're going to refresh the page again. We know that our conditional breakpoint is working for bad data, right? So let's refresh again and see if it stops now that we've made our fix. And it didn't, which is great. So if we go back to our page and we sort again, now we're getting no blanks. Okay, so we're making some progress here. We're finally moving forward, right? So let's refresh this again. So that was weird, did you guys see that? Let's say it's loading twice, right? So uh, what it looks like is we might be fetching twice from the back end, right? Again, who's running to that problem before you realize you submit twice or fetch twice, right? Not great. And your server counterparts probably aren't huge fans of you doing that, right? So let's look at that. And here I want to show you guys a new section uh, called the scope tab. So what we're going to do is we don't need to be in the iterator anymore for right now. Let's go and look at roughly where we stopped originally in here, okay? And let's refresh and let it hit there. Okay, here, uh, sorry, not scope, the call stack. So looking at the call stack here, uh, for the call stack, we can reverse, in reverse order, traverse backwards what brought us to this point in the call stack. Everything above this line are the synchronous steps that took us there, and this is actually a relatively new thing. We also get past this line all of the asynchronous steps that took us there, which is super, super helpful. So if we do that, let's walk our way back and see what call this load talks, okay? We see uh, here is the, the, the original line that we're at right now. Uh, here's the function declaration. Here's the bind action creators. Remember when we first started, we first drilled in and said, okay, now here's where it's being bound, the, the React thing we talked about. And if we go one more step back, we see here in component will mount, that is, if I click on it here, that is the line that originally brought us down into here. And that makes sense, right? Because when we first started, this is exactly what we did in reverse order. We started at component will mount, we drilled all the way into it, and we got to that point. So it makes sense that when we refresh and we work our way back up the call stack, that we'll find that same location. So this one is fine, and it's when we want it to be happening. So we're good there. Let's go back to our original spot, and let's play through. And look at that, we are calling it twice. I didn't refresh, I just hit play. And it is being called a second time. So let's do the same exercise. And from the call lead, we'll work our way back. Here's the declaration. Here's the bind action creators. And look at that. Right under our component will mount, and our component did mount, we are now calling it a second time, right? Uh, don't know who did that, right? But there it is, twice, right? 
This is a contrived example, but it's an important thing I want to show you guys because you could you say, well, I could have just done a find everywhere for load talks, but what if you had 50 different components that loaded talks in different ways, right? That's not really going to get you anywhere. With this way, traversing back up the call stack is a great way to see in the immediate context of what you're seeing, what exactly brought you here, okay? So that's cool. I want to show you one more thing uh, in terms of the uh, call stack, and then we can move on from that because it is pretty neat. Remember how from here we got our async data, then we came down, we iterated through all of them, we called prepare talks for display, and then we got it all ready. Let's jump into, let's take it off here, let's jump into prepare talks for display, and I'm gonna show you one more thing. If I hit play, right, we move through all that, we're on our first iteration. Obviously, we can hover over and we see the talk, right? But now remember that we originally, or what, when, we, when we called this, we had access to index, and we had access to the talk, right? But if I try and this is another tip too. Uh, in pretty much anywhere in DevTools, if you hit escape, you get a little console that pops up, which is kind of nice. You don't have to go back and forth in the tab. If I type in talk, the talk is shown, but if I type in index, I get a runtime error because it's not in scope, right? It's not in scope go ahead, at where we are right now. But if I do the same backwards traversal that we just did and I move back up to the iterator where it was called, I can now call talk and index. I don't know if for those of you that are new to this understood what we just did here. We're now moving backwards in history through the call stack and Chrome DevTools is holding on for us to the relevant scopes each step of the way. That is huge, right? Because imagine if we were inside a prepare talk for display and we move through a few times, uh, don't do that, here we go. I move through a few times and I say, oh, okay, for whatever reason, uh, Derek Lynch's talk, I really want to look into what's going on here, but Damn, well, I didn't pass index as, a, as an argument. Like, well, what index were we at again? You can just go one step up your call stack and you go, uh, let's see here. Oh, index is five. Okay, cool. And you go, okay, index is five. What is that relative to the talks around it? You can go up one more step in the call stack, right, to here. And now you can hover over all the talks, right? Really, really cool way to go back and forth and see the relevant scopes at different times. One thing to point out, this asynchronous break here is a nice thing that Google added in that shows you how you got here, but once you move past this asynchronous line, you no longer have access to the scope at that time. So it'll help you with an asynchronous uh, step things to go back and see how you got there, but if you want to see those scopes, you're going to have to set a breakpoint at that time and then drill back down from there, okay? So, good. Let's uh, play through here, go back to our page, and uh, for the sake of those in the back, let's try and make this a little bit more readable, okay? So we're going to open up DevTools. Now we're going to move over to the Elements panel, okay? The Elements panel is going to show us a DOM representation of everything that's on the page, okay? If I hover over any of these things, I can actually see them being highlighted in real time. There's been a lot of work done to help you like quick highlighting and find these things. But now, instead of trying to figure out exactly what this is and hunt through my DOM, I can instead go to my uh, Element Inspector and click anywhere on my page and then it will tell me exactly where that is in the DOM for me without having to hunt through it. So when that pops up, I see here that I've got this table text class and that's what's controlling my yellow text, right? Something to show you that was recently added, I think only last version of the one before, which is really nice, is that if you hover over any class in the CSS properties, it will highlight for you every class, every element affected by that class on the page. So this is pretty cool, right? Because we see that uh, if I were to change just table text, it looks like for free, I'll get a color fix on everything on the page. So that's really useful. So let's say I want to change my color to, uh, if you guys have been to this page recently, I really like this cool green that we use here, right? So I want to change this to that color. So I can open DevTools on this page, clear the console, get the element inspector, and we see here the color is white, but what I really want is this green one here, right? So if I open it up, it looks like as soon as I go off it, I lose that color, right? Fortunately, they thought of this, the Chrome DevTools team, and if I click on here, Check out this guy, toggle element state. We can take an element on the DOM and we can toggle what state it is in currently. So if I check off hover, it shows me the state of this thing as if it was being hovered over, which is super cool. I can see here, it's a little bigger. I can see here that this is the exact color of uh, that when it's being hovered on. Let's say your team doesn't work at hex values and they prefer RGB because you're UI people, I don't know, whatever, right? Uh, if normally you take this hex value you would go out to some color page, find the equivalent, and then paste that into your code. If you shift-click on the color, 
DevTools will automatically tell you the, the equivalent representations of that for the different colors. So let's grab this RGB one. And, oh, and well, we can leave this page. Thank you for your help, help page. <laughs> um, oh yeah, table text is, the, is, a, is a class we want to modify, right? So let's find table text. There it is, paste that in. And cool, so now this is good, right? We're looking better, easier to read. Let's look at something else though. If we go back to this table text property, and actually, yeah, and instead of shift clicking, I just regular click on this color, I get a rating here. I have a contrast ratio with sort of this like this no smoking sign on top of it, right? If I click on that and expand it, I see that from an accessibility standpoint, the contrast between this color and its background is not very accessible to people that have uh, vision problems or have trouble differentiating colors, right? You have two lines here. If we were just to move this and drag it one line down, we are now getting a double A rating in terms of accessibility. If we move below the second line, we are now, let's make it as neon as possible, we are now, as we are AAA accessible, very easy to read between this color and its background, and we know that we're not leaving people behind. If I close out of here, by the way, this has been updating in real time. Oh, look at that. When I, I guess this is live coding. Don't hit cancel to enter. Okay, this is updated in real time. So I'm gonna take that and paste it in over here. Cool, and it's refresh. Okay. Uh, sweet. Oh, you know what? <laughs> Did you guys see that? <coughs> we found the error, but never fixed it, right? So, thanks for not calling me out on that, for those who had noticed immediately when I did that. So, let's go back there, uh, the DevTools index. Let's take out uh, this guy. We don't need you. You've served your purpose. Um, one time. Fantastic, and it's more readable. Okay, so we're looking better, right? Uh, let's start looking at some of these talks, though. Um, who's got a good talk? Killer. Oh, he's a good one. Uh, what about, uh, Mark, that's good. Uh, but you know what, let's see. Oh, that's a huge picture. <laughs> also a good looking dude, but a very big picture. So, uh, let's try and make this a more reasonable size. It looks like those guys had uploaded more reasonably sized pictures, and I'm so vain that I was like, I want to take over the whole page, right? So let's open uh, DevTools again, Element Inspector, hover over it. Uh, this is a pretty basic one, but I want to show you guys because I want to drive home a certain point. This thumbnail class is going to affect the max width of this image, right? I can click on here, instead of typing in a value, I can just move the arrows up and down, and it'll do it in real time. This is probably not mind-blowing as JavaScript developers, but I want you to stop and think for a second for our counterparts doing native development on iOS and Android. Every time they make a change, even a style change, they have to recompile, restart their simulator, and we're talking about on the order of minutes of how long it takes to have those things show back up. You've got this tool for free provided by the Google team where literally you have instant feedback for any kind of change you want to make. We did it for our color earlier of our text and now we're doing it for the size of this image. Really, really cool. Like really that's awesome. I do. That's why I'm doing this talk. I'm really excited about it. But like, uh, it's a pretty neat thing. So uh, we'll go here. Max with 50%. That looks good. And it was the thumbnail class. Uh, let's up here. And let's make that 50%. Home stretch. I must be talking way faster than I when I practice this because we're really good, doing good on time. Uh, good. So that's looking good. Sweet. Notice, however, that everybody's presenter's names are there, but not Coral Guillermo. And it looks like this is also missing here. I want to show you guys one more thing uh, that, uh, that I think uh, is sort of a cool thing to, to consider. Uh, we're going to go back to our sources tab. We're going to uh, go back to our breakpoint. We'll full screen this. Let's go back to our iterator. Let's refresh. Who actually? Uh, here we go. I can show you two things at once. For some of you here that are thinking, hey, Guillermo, look, this is all great and everything, but by its very nature, the code coming to a grinding halt and stopping totally blows away some of the error conditions of bugs that I'm trying to fix, right? And so if something is inherently timing based or it's a race condition or whatever else, stopping it mid flight will probably kill the condition you're trying to recreate, right? So for that, uh, what I would recommend is instead of writing console logs into your code, you can do a new thing that was recently, I mean, I think just in the last release added in, where you take your traditional breakpoint, you right click on it, and you put, uh, actually, sorry, get this here, add log point. A log point is the exact equivalent of you writing console log, but you don't have to write anything into your code, and it's automatically inserted for you. Where we would normally write console.log, some information here, 
The log point is going to bring us into these parentheses already. Oh, that guy's not a fan. Uh, <laughs> this will bring us into these parentheses already, right? And, uh, and we'll be able to put whatever logging we want at this point. So imagine we're inside the parentheses of console.log, and let's say like this talk is same way you do in a console, like you put a comma in the next thing or whatever you want to log, right? Uh, hit enter. And now if I open up my little Chrome in the bottom, or my console in the bottom and refresh. Um, so, oh, we still have this breakpoint down here. So let's play through. And here we go. So they all just populated themselves here, right? So I want to set, I remember what brought us here. It looked like my talk was missing the first name and last name. So let's do a quick find for DevTools here. Uh, the ID of my talk is 218. So what should we do? Let's set another conditional breakpoint and stop. So we're only stopping at my talk. We don't have to move through 40 of them to get there, right? So get that out of the way. Take this out of here. Let's uh, do a conditional breakpoint. If the ID is exactly equal to 218, only stop in that condition. Let's refresh. And nothing, right? Oh, thank you. That's why I invited you, Mike. Yeah. Trusty companion. All right, here we go. So now we get to talk back, and then we see, sure enough, first name and last name are blank. Okay, this is probably pretty obvious, but I do. When I bring all these things up, I want you to think about like how you might actually apply it at work, right? And the problems that you're solving. I want you to think about something right now. Remember how we said that in the console we have access to anything that's in scope if we want to look at it. Something that may not have been immediately obvious. We not only have access to look at anything in scope. We can actually modify anything in scope directly. So if I do talk.firstname equals Guillermo and talk.lastname equals moratorio, this too is awesome. <laughs> right? Now, if I were to close this here and get out of there and hit play, and let's do a search, look at that. This is automatically populated in the state of my React application. This is really cool for two reasons. One, if you have a, a, a defect in the field that you can't seem to recreate, right? I, I've done this before where it's like, hey, you have a deployed server that's remote and, uh, and they tell you, hey, we're having this, this defect, we can't figure out what's going on. You try and recreate it, you can't recreate it, right? But sometimes you're pretty suspicious that it's this specific area of code that's causing the problem. The cool thing about stopping with a breakpoint, modifying the state, and letting it play through, is you can artificially break a deployed server if you wanted to, right? Let's say it's a test server or whatever, don't do it in production. But you can like artificially break one and see if the break is the same symptoms that are being reported. And then you say, okay, yeah, under these broken conditions, it does have manifest the same way. So now let me fix that and see if that's what it's gonna do. The other piece, which I kind of said a two and one there, the other piece is you can also confirm on the flip side, if you are able to reproduce something, by literally, I said, okay, you know what's probably the name is coming in blank. By just populating the name, I know, okay, yeah, that does fix it. And all I need to know is if the name comes in populated, the rest is going to work. So let me just hit up my backend developer and be like, hey, sh what should we do here? Like, why is that name coming through? Okay, so that's pretty cool. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention uh, when we were talking about the log points is uh, two reasons why log points I think are useful and important uh, when we were like logging to the console. Uh, I would say, one, once again, with remote servers, you can't get into them and write a console log, so that's one use case for that. And the other one is, you don't want to forget console logs in your PRs and be embarrassed by your peers, <laughs> or worse, they don't embarrass you and then it makes it to deploy code, right? So you really don't want to do that. Um, cool. So I think at this point, right, we're in a pretty good spot where we've got our, uh, our talks coming back, we can sort them and they're not all broken. We can drill into them. The pictures look good. So yeah, I think I covered everything I wanted to cover. Let's find out. What we saw. Uh, we looked at the elements and seen their DOM tree, their DOM view, the element inspector to go and jump to one directly. Class highlighting, where we hover over any class, we see all the ones that are affected on the page. Color format changing to shift and click and change between RGB, SLA, or hex. Uh, hover toggle, where if we hover over any item, we'll see its values, or if we uh, <coughs> highlight, oh no, sorry, if we toggle the state of elements when they are hovered, so we're looking at here, and uh, also accessibility ratings, right, and seeing how we can make our, our uh, app more accessible. In sources, whether the call stack, how to traverse backwards, see where we came from, and also see the scope of any of those things as we're going back. Scope we just talked about, traditional breakpoints where we can step into them, over them, or play through. 
conditional breakpoints where we only stop under certain criteria, hover and highlighting on objects or arrays, or doing it uh, the whole function and seeing its return, and then loggers. For the console, we can inspect anything in scope with larger real estate. Um, objects and arrays. Oh, one thing I didn't point out, but you probably saw it, uh, especially if you work with uh, the console at all lately. This was added about six months ago. But if you noticed, when we, uh, when we print out an object or an array, previously it would just say, like an array, it'd say, we have all these things in here and that's it. And now, what DevTools does, if you notice, they give you nice little previews on each line of here's sort of the top level items in this item in the array, but they haven't expanded, so that's cool. Eager evaluation that we saw, and honestly, this eager evaluation can be anything, right? We can do like 100 times 12, or whatever, minus, you know, whatever times that, minus zero, plus whatever. And it tells you what it's going to evaluate to. This can be for any expression, no matter how complex, so that's pretty cool. And we saw how we had eager evaluation across all of DevTools, and then modifying variables in real time when we needed to. <laughs> Here's the hotkeys that I went over. Don't need to memorize them, you can look them up, but now you know that they're there, and you saw how quickly I can navigate through DevTools using them. I highly recommend you get used to them because it really, really improves your speed in debugging. Did that picture come out? Oh, wait. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, yeah, uh, open depth tools with command option J. Uh, the source file search is cool with command P. Step over into and play. Left and right tab toggle and then clear in the console. All right. If you've enjoyed depth tools as much as I do, right, then and you want to do some, uh, you know, some light reading at home on your weekends, uh, <laughs> this link here. Uh, will take you to all of the release notes from the Chrome DevTools team for the past, I don't even know how long. And then if you go to this playlist, right, not an easy one to write down by hand, these will be posted. If you go to this playlist, it's actually a YouTube playlist of case from the DevTools team going with every release, highlights of what's in the release notes with live coding examples. And lately, for the past like six to eight months or so, they've also been including what they call like little bonus tips, which is stuff that's been around in DevTools for a while, but maybe you didn't know about and are kind of helpful. Okay, did that help? Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, raise your hand if you learned at least one thing new. Oh, nobody, to the camera didn't see you. <laughs> so yeah, I, I'm really glad to hear that, fantastic. So um, yeah, so now the last thing to do is just, is just go out, use that new stuff you learned, and go and fix those gnarly bugs, right? One thing I was on the fence about saying, but I think it is too funny, especially because this is a talk that I'm doing today. Uh, all of us walking around, the volunteers, have this really neat, if you guys are looking at this really neat little thing where it says, you know, if, if volunteer, then I help you, or if not, you have questions. This is not staged or planned. I just noticed today when Kyle was sitting in front of me, there is a defect on that code. Right <laughs> it's there. I challenge, it's hard to do breakpoints on a t-shirt, but I challenge all of you <laughs> to try and figure out what the defect is uh, on the shirt. If you figure out what it is, uh, as long as the open bar is open today, I will get you a drink. Okay? <laughs> Thank you guys so much. My name is Guillermo Moratorio. Uh, if you have any questions at all, you want to talk DevTools, come and see us at Denver Script. We're the last Tuesday of every month. And if not, send me a message on Denver Devs. I'd be more than happy to chat with you about it. Um, and we can even chat after this. The bar opened at 12, and it is now 12.41. So I'm going to go get a celebratory beer right after this. And if you'd like to chat more about it, I'll see you there. Thank you guys so much. Enjoy the <laughs>